Welcome back, this is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. Today we're gonna to do part two of thymine deficiency, or B1. Last week we spoke about how B1 is a rate-limiting cofactor in a lot of enzymatic processes, and it's important for oxygen homeostasis as well as ATP production or energy production from your cells. Today we're going to talk about the foods and subclinical signs of B1 deficiency. B1 deficiency, thymine deficiency, so many symptoms. So let's talk about food first. Foods high in thymine, beans, legumes, dairy, meat, fish, pork, whole grains, peas, nutritional yeast, seafood, asparagus. There's an interesting story about whole grains. Uh, back in the late uh, 1800s in Japan, they started to uh, process the rice. So they used to mill the rice. Um, and the wealthy were enjoying the white rice versus the, the poor population were still using the whole uh, grain. Some of the wealthy population started to develop beriberi or significant overt uh, thymine deficiency. So it's better to have the whole grain versus a processed grain. Symptoms related to um, subclinical thyroid deficiencies. Fatigue or general fatigue, weight loss, confusion, muscle weakness. So you're working out and you still don't have that oomph. For whatever reason, your muscles start to fatigue out. Peripheral neuropathy, decreased immune system, cold hands and feet. Raynons. Sometimes it can be associated for Raynons. Mood swings, irritability, GI discomfort, decrease in appetite. You can see how there's so many different symptoms and systems that can be affected. And if you went and you had mood swings and irritability, you might be given an antidepressant. If you have GI discomfort, they might just give you fiber or some sort of medication to help with that. Or if you have a poor immune system, they will start to look into different viruses and all this stuff. So thymine deficiency uh, is kind of like an umbrella of these symptoms. It's used for AIDS, canker sores, cataracts, cerebellar syndrome. Cerebellar syndrome. So it also impacts balance uh, if you have thymine deficiency. So you may get dizziness and so forth. Diabetes, peripheral neuropathy, cardiovascular disease, autonomic dysfunction, weakened immune system. So you can use this in a lot of different conditions. In autonomic dysfunction, you can have a uh, heart rate increase or tachycardia, right? Uh, you can have swelling in your legs and so forth. Sometimes this autonomic type symptoms or POTS, uh, you're treating but you're not getting to the bottom of it. And sometimes it can just be a thymine deficiency. <clears throat> now there is testing available for thymine. However, uh, there are different tests and some are very expensive and not commercially available. So there's some problems with testing, right? Really B vitamin or B1 is a water soluble vitamin and there is no harm in taking uh, larger amounts to see if you have a B vitamin deficiency. So I don't really recommend any specific tests for a B1 deficiency. Decreased thymine availability and increased demand. These are the factors. If you have a high carbohydrate diet, because thymine is, is part of the process that converts uh, carbohydrates to energy, high carbohydrates will deplete your thymine. Food chemicals you know, things that they put into your foods, uh, coloring and so forth. Obesity, alcohol, tobacco, coffee, and tea. Coffee and tea has something called tannins, which can also inhibit absorption of thymine. Medications and environmental toxins will also um, hinder the process of absorption and utilization of thymine. Now let's talk about the different forms. You have thymine HCL, you have thymine mononitrate, both are synthetic forms. Benfothymine is a liposoluble uh, thymine, so it stays in your system a little bit longer and the half-life is longer, right? Increases blood thymine levels by 100 
to 240% uh, more than regular thymine. Also impacts the brain significantly because there's a lot of fat tissue in the brain, right? So the brain can be impacted significantly with benfothiamine. TTFD, thymine tetrahydrofurfurlol disulfide. It's a long name, right? It's another form of thymine. And uh, some say that it's actually the most absorbable or highly, highly active. At the end of the day, if you're going to take high doses of uh, thymine, you need to work with a physician who understands what's going on because it's not just about getting your recommended daily allowance of vitamin uh, B1. It's about saturation and optimal levels. So sometimes you can use high levels of B vitamins or benfothiamine or TTFD uh, to get a more profound effect with certain patients but I would suggest using a, or uh, doing it with the help of a physician who understands what's going on with that, okay? Typical dosages, uh, 50 to 100 milligrams twice a day, sometimes three times a day. If you're doing three times, I would go 50, 50, 50. Uh, again, the short half-life uh, of B vitamins, you need to kind of separate out the B vitamins. And higher dosages, uh, again, work with a physician. So this is the basic idea of how things work with B vitamins, and it is a great mimicker of a lot of different conditions. Um, and it's usually pretty safe if you're taking a water-soluble vitamin uh, to increase thymine levels. Um, what I failed to mention right over here is you can use nutritional yeast, which has the B vitamins in it too, which is a natural form, uh, or eat the foods that are higher in thymine. Um, but you can use these forms to help improve uh, some of the signs and symptoms of subclinical thymine deficiency. Okay, my name is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results, and we'll see you guys next week on the healthy side. Have an awesome day.